Okay, good morning and welcome to the Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife. This morning we're taking up S226, an act relating to expanding access to safe and affordable housing. And with us this morning we have um, one of the bill's main sponsors, the bill's main sponsor, Keisha, Senator Keisha Rahm Hinsdale, and uh, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Committee, for the record. Senator Keisha Rahm Hinsdale of Chittenden County. Um, I wasn't able to connect with Ellen just to be sure about which pieces are of interest to and under the jurisdiction of this committee. Um, so I think I'll speak broadly and then just take any questions you may have. That's um, for the bill sponsor at, at any rate. So. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I would say uh, just two things. Number one, you all are going to receive an environmental justice bill soon that we've discussed. And this is, I think, part and parcel with that in that environmental justice is different than conventional environmentalism. It's focused on livable, walkable, transit-oriented housing in places where you can achieve density <laughs> and ensure that, you know, you have safe, affordable housing for folks. So, you know, I often say for people of color and low-income people, being part of the environmental movement is not just saying the same things that people have been saying just with different faces and different incomes. Um, it really is about having that, you know, sense of community and ability to afford uh, safe and healthy housing and have it be, um, you know, in neighborhood centers. Um, yeah. so Thank you. I really set out to do a housing bill that had a little bit about permitting, not a permitting bill that had a little bit about housing. We've all been talking about the uh, the housing crisis that we're facing in uh, in Vermont and it's not unique to Vermont, but you know, as as you may know, we have a very high vacancy rate, the highest vacancy rate in the country. Um, we have you know a really strong, robust set of permitting and planning principles in the state. You know better than I do, <laughs> um, and we have to make sure that those are still allowing more housing to be built in the places that we want it. Um, and I think so often what I've observed being, being at one point vice chair of natural resources and energy in the house and also bookending that with service on the house committee on housing and now the Senate committee on housing is the conversation around permitting and building more housing can sometimes get lost between the two committees. And we need to have a housing bill that addresses a little bit of permitting, um, not, you know, sort of make it solely focused on permitting. And, you know, we care, we, we all care about our environment. We also care about making sure that we have enough housing to house Vermonters right now in, in a crisis. And so as a member of the housing committee, I sought to take all the best ideas about how to build more housing, which is what we need in the state. Great, do members have questions? That is McCullough. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. Chair. Yeah. Are you Vice Chair? You... I be. Okay, great. I was <laughs> either that a ranking member, but I remember you being Vice Chair. <laughs> um, so that's a question I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of them, right. I'm not so sure. I usually take questions from the witness, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, likely we'll get into this elsewhere in the bill, yet I've asked the question several times and haven't gotten an answer from others who presented. Mm. The 55, the 55, we're not, we're not talking about environmental justice right now. <laughs> oh, true enough. Yeah. But I will answer that question at a different time as well. Uh, we, well, yes. <laughs> And so, I'll, so you know what the question is. I do. Ask, and and we'll <laughs> I'll re ask it. Thank you. I was getting worried because I couldn't think about the fifty five in the housing bill was, yeah. but I know exactly what you're talking about the EJ bill. Yeah. All right. Was that your question? All right. It was. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <clairvoyant> chair. <laughs> I got the fifty five right away. Uh, Representative uh, uh, Good morning. Good, good morning. morning. And this question may be more suited for the state as well, but when you talk about ensuring that we have safe housing mm -hmm. we're always concerned if you're building on floodplain where you're putting more people in harm's way mm -hmm. even though our historic villages were built on streams 
to take advantage of that and that power for milling, for example, or, or energy, uh, there's still a concern that, especially during climate where we're seeing, even now, the increased frequency of severe weather and the potential impacts of putting more people in harm's way. Yeah. So in your mind, does this bill, when you talk about safe housing, is it a responsible bill to find that, um, that I guess that way forward to accommodate housing where you want it in downtown areas, while at the same time, are we being careful enough to uh, not put more people in harm's way? Yeah, I think it's a great question. You know, I think there's there's two, potentially two areas, general buckets in the bill where you might find us wrestling with that question, maybe more. But, you know, one is trying to articulate that if we are giving any funds to existing properties or homes in floodplains, that the resources be directed to sort of lifting them up or mitigating the impact. So we, you know, the reality in Vermont is we already have um, a lot of housing and floodplains, particularly mobile homes. And when I, I hope you you may hear from Sandrine Kibui or others from the Mobile Home Project, um, you know, when I saw the effort from the administration to um, create buyout funds made available to individuals to relocate out of floodplains. I thought that was a good start to the conversation. I do worry about who's going to be left behind if we're talking about individual buyouts. And so this, the idea of this bill was to go to the communities themselves and say, you know, who, what do you need to feel safe in the existing home you're in? And how can we also wrap this conversation in resources around community relocation and properties or, you know, planning that might help people transition away from these areas. As I I think I said in in the environmental justice bill, people in mobile home communities were 8% of the population, but 40% of the flooding victims of Hurricane Irene. So we need to be thinking a lot about the next disasters and who's in these areas. I put the resources in that were the requests of the people closest to the situation on the ground who are saying, you know, people need accessibility repair and relocation. Um, And we can't sort of, in my mind, let the perfect us like, you know, telling people this is the time to move and here's a little bit of money be the, be get in the way of helping people right now with impaired unsafe housing. Um, So, you know, it was a real balance and I hope this engenders a larger conversation around the state getting creative about state land and other places that mobile home communities can move with the wraparound support and resources directed in these funds and other funds. Um, Those are the folks I worry about the most. And then, so, I mean, we have, you know, commercial properties and other homes of greater value in floodplains as well. I think we've seen that those folks need help as often too. And, you know, in Tropical Storm Irene, I rem- I don't know. Looking around, I mean, I know I know Representative McCullough was here, but you know, we went to the housing committee went to Waterbury and Duxbury, and Waterbury people were helping people shovel things out, you know, stripping things down to the studs and airing it out and helping people rebuild. And we went to a mobile home community in Duxbury, and they said we haven't seen anybody for four days. We feel completely left behind. We you know we have nothing and no one. And it, we watched planes fly overhead and go to Waterbury and never come see us. And so those that's who I worry about in, a, in terms of resiliency and disaster. And um, we are really far from giving them the resources they need to make to have agency in the decisions about where they go and how safe their housing is. Great, thanks. Um, not seeing any further questions. Thank I, you for- I One other question. Uh, in the other, um, area of, of interest is to ensure that we're providing housing in our smaller communities as mm-hmm. well. In your mind, does this bill help to provide not only uh, safe, affordable housing in our larger cities and, and towns? Are, are there 
is there in your mind an adequate focus for our smaller, more rural communities? I think taken in totality, we tried to ensure that there was something for communities of different sizes. So we have another bill about what we call mini TIFs, which are just smaller, you know, neighborhood development areas. Um, and so we've tried to look at who, you know, usually gets the largest share of this pie and how do we redistribute that. Um, I had a couple. I had a couple provisions in this bill, and I looking around because I think one survived. Um, you know, the the two provisions were around um, getting doing matching funds for institutions, and I believe that did survive in the bill. So, you know, if you if you have Grace Cottage Hospital, or you know, really it could be a smaller institution. <clears throat> we have a lot of communities right now, for example, that have colleges that are transitioning to be something else. Uh, you know, Green Mountain College in Pulteney, for example, where we should be trying to create a matching fund so that they can redevelop and revitalize. Um, and so by larger institutions, larger hospitals and colleges, they can build more housing um, and not put a strain on the housing market anywhere. So I think that provision did survive. I had another that was about a fund for transitioning commercial properties to residential, where someone you know thought, oh, this is going to be a great little industrial park or whatever, a little um, you know, commercial building, and there may never be the same need for commercial space in the near term again, um, helping those properties with the resources to put in plumbing, to do fire safety, whatever is needed for habitability. Um, I don't know that that survived in this bill, um, but we, I tried to think about all the towns and asking them what they needed. This bill also has a TIF extension. Um, which I know doesn't help our smallest communities, but taken alongside that mini TIF, you know, I think that a lot of our medium-sized towns, a lot of the Benningtons, the Berries, they're the ones who have, you know, I mean, in Berry, I was told we have 300 job listings and three housing listings. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I know they're not a small town, but these are our medium-sized communities that are becoming the hub for people to try and find a job and try to find somewhere to live. And they're asking for you know, the resources they need. Now that they have that money for housing, they need to build it. And so this bill tries to sort of clear some of the red tape and underpin um, the planning processes they need to build the housing. And I think that will help. We all, then there's V, the, there's other uh, dollars for blighted properties and properties that need to be upgraded for habitability. I think that helps in areas where you might have a historic home that is sort of sitting on its own that needs um, repair for, for someone to become a homeowner. Thank you. Have a quick, quick look at that. Keep going. We have a lot of witnesses. Go ahead. Um, you know, you said that uh, Vermont has the highest vacancy rate in the nation. Does that include second homes and primary homes together? Because what's happening in, in many of the smaller towns where I'm from is that we're losing a sense of community because so many homes are being bought up by people who recreate there, who come for, you know, uh, for snowmobiling, for any kind of recreational uh, activities in the woods. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is less and less uh, primary homeowners, uh, in which, of course, then, you know, less and less folks to help pay for the services. And I'm just wondering if that, if that, if that highest vacancy rate pertains to uh, secondary homeowners as well. That's exactly what it was about. Um, you know, we often look at New York and California and think, oh, they must they have so many rich people's life of the rich and famous. Those are sitting empty. Maine and Vermont, um, about a quarter of the properties in the state are vacant, whereas it's about 10 percent in those larger states. So we're talking about second homes. And, you know, we're, we're looking at a place like Woodstock that's trying to, um, you know, pay people to create long term rental housing at this point. Um, but this bill, I did not poke the bear of vacancy per se in this bill, and we didn't have that figure from the New York Times article that I'm happy to send when I drafted the bill, but it should be cause for concern for all of us. We don't have to increase our footprint necessarily. We have to figure out a way to incentivize people to open up their homes for seasonal workers or um, for long-term rentals, because that's a quarter of our housing stock that sits vacant for this definition, which is a lot about when people are there and how often. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. Good luck. Thanks. Great. With that, I'd like to go to Seth Leonard, who is joining us via Zoom. 
Good morning. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Seth Leonard. I'm the Managing Director of Community Development at Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And Lizzie, I think I'm okay to share my screen. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you. Did that come through okay for everyone? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so I think what I've been asked to do today is to um, help the committee think through how much housing we, we need in this state, where we are in terms of need, uh, where we need it, and a little bit about the state's land use regulatory environment, land use planning apparatuses, and I guess what we would probably all say is this historic opportunity for one-time investments in housing community development and how those can work together. Does that, that sound right in terms of um, what would be productive for me to cover today? Yes. Great. Okay, so um, I think most presentations when they come about put citations and resources at the end of the presentation. I think it's really critical to point out that a lot of these, uh, the thinking, the thoughts and the policy development resources um, that underpin S226 are part of much longer conversations. Um, and many of the solutions and ideas didn't come out of thin air and the pressures that they're addressing in the housing community and, and community development world are very real measured and, and studied in a lot of cases. So you should all have a, a copy of my presentation with these links. I think it's, it's great to have these handy. Um, what you see is a housing needs assessment there at the top that was done prior to the pandemic setting in. And the housing needs assessment showed us that in Vermont, we have 90, 000, over 90,000 now um, homeowner and renter households that are cost burdened by their housing costs. That's 36% of every Vermont household that are paying more than 30% of their income on housing costs. And of that amount, 39,000 or 16% of all the households in the state are paying more than 50% for our costs. The housing needs assessment made it clear that we had an affordability issue in Vermont prior to the pandemic exacerbating those issues. We had a, a statewide housing cost study from early 2020, which again, pre-pandemic, that highlighted that we were already seeing a real pressure on our affordable housing development resources in general. And housing development um, was feeling stressed from a, a well-defined combination of regulatory permitting and process um, issues um, combined with emerging labor and material costs. Um, in 2021, um, we created a report focused on how land use regulations at the local level are not always working in coordination with um, the regional state and sometimes even the community's own vision for where housing should be built. Um, we surveyed 69 towns and 22 of those towns don't have zoning less than a half acre anywhere in their community. That's not a good recipe for, um, for building in, in the right places, we would say, in, in, in a lot of areas. We had a 2021 report called the State of Development in Vermont. Many of the slides today are gonna to be continuations of that report that show that really we've encountered a bit of a, a perfect storm when it comes to pre-existing conditions and pandemic exacerbated factors um, that are putting pressure on the housing, um, the housing stock in our state. And then you have, um, I like to say the timeless resource that I hope you all have visited before, which is housingdata.org. Um, which is our repository for the state's housing data, uh, best policy practices, tools for local communities and legislators when thinking about housing issues. So if you haven't visited there, I encourage you to do so. And I just wanna point out too that um, we in the affordable housing and community development area really work hard to align policies. And you'll find that in the investment, the key investment policies like the qualified allocation plan for affordable housing, um, there is prioritization of smart growth. There's prioritization of energy efficiency, of um, ensuring that homes are being built with access to transportation um, and that we're considering climate impact. Um, so I, I wanna make that clear off the start is we do approach um, the development of housing, not just as accounting um, or an accounting of units. We're being very thoughtful about where those investments are being placed year over year, um, pandemic or not. Um, and making sure that we're serving the state and communities in the best way possible. I think this chart really helps um, frame how, um, how, what causes housing to get built or not get built in the state. And it says two critical things. One is that builders and developers are always gonna size their pipeline, be them nonprofit or for-profit entities based on how much capital they think that they can get to build housing. 
Um, and we've done quite a bit um, in terms of ARPA in moving the needle on that. Um, Vermont was a leader in proposing investment of dollars into housing investment that has now been followed by the entire country. Um, and the, um, the numbers in other states are staggering in terms of what they've recognized um, in terms of their housing needs. They're, they wanna put their one-time or ARPA funding towards. Um, so that's, that's been uh, incredible to watch. And then the second piece is builders thrive on predictability and stable permitting and regulatory processes. Um, it costs a lot of money to um, get halfway through a development, have a long delay. It costs a lot of money um, and, and time um, that sometimes builders just walk away from or, or don't take a risk um, if they can't be a clear path um, forward. Um, so at the onset of the uh, pandemic, we had that housing needs assessment I, I referenced on that first page. And the magic number in terms of need um, to maintain the state's affordability to um, backfill units that were going offline because of aging stock was that we needed to create about 5,800 units by 2025. So again, this was a snapshot in 2020. And we said in the next five years, if we just wanna keep status quo and um, offset some of these impacts to the house uh, cost burn households, we need to create 5,800 um, households. Um, in a given year, um, in non-pandemic times, we have roughly about $60 million in affordable housing development capital in the state that goes to a lot of different, sometimes targeted specific areas, but if you take that thinking, um, we have roughly enough to produce around 200 units year over year um, of affordable housing development resources in a normal non-pandemic, non-ARPA um, time period. So you can imagine that making up 5,800 um, units when you're trying to solve that problem um, feels like a, a tall mountain to climb. So what we're excited about in S226 um, is that there is a placement of additional capital in gaps that we think were existing. Um, that Senator Ron um, really touched on in terms of um, picking places to make investments where perhaps there weren't pre-existing or already um, targeted funds. Um, and then also supporting the statewide planning designation programs to increase predictability that instills trust that projects can come to fruition. And most importantly, that we're building the right buildings in the right places, uh, because that's what we all wanna see. So again, filling, um, We've applauded those efforts to both uh, simultaneously make investments in areas where there are gaps, first generation home buyer assistance, medicine, middle and um, home ownership development investments, manufactured home community needs. Um, but we also applaud that it's being paired with um, the statewide designation program, which we use to prioritize our investments as well, uh, municipal planning investments, um, and help make uh, and guide critical capital investments for communities. Um, and what's really exciting is a lot of the communities are also doing this with their own local uh, recovery funds and want to make um, want to make progress on on housing and other community development issues too. But here's the sobering reality of what we're dealing with in the state. So um, that's the raw raw portion of things. Um, now I'm going to go a little bit more into kind of where things are at. And pre-pandemic, we had reached uh, what was really a near stagnation um, in terms of rate of growth in our housing stock in our state. 0.18% uh, um, was our going rate, which um, going back several years, we, could, we would be a couple percent positive of the number of units we we're adding in our overall housing stock. Um, so we've chronically underbuilt housing in the state for the last couple of decades, um, and a lack of supply has inevitably put some pressure on prices and created more um, affordability and cost burden issues amongst households. Um, and there are longstanding sort of institutional issues around permitting and regulatory issues I think you all have grappled with in a number of different times. And then there's cost controls too happening that are outside of our control, uh, like labor and market materials. But the reality is, is, as a country, for the first time, we just hit a pretty staggering mark, which is the median sales price in the United States for a home just crossed $400,000 for the first time in our history. Vermont's not quite there, but we are on our way. So um, $400,000 was, a, I think, a big shock to the national system about where prices are, um, but this curve gives you a pretty good picture of where um, things have been heading. And our housing market's been um, tight and hot since before the pandemic, um, but it's fanned the flames, right? The pressures of the pandemic have flamed the flames. So pre-pandemic prices um, increased around 2 to 3% each year. Um, but jumped 10% from 2020 to 2021. Um, and overall have increased by 19% over the course of the pandemic. 
And I can tell you that construction prices have done almost exactly the same thing. I'll show you a chart in a little bit that tells you where we are in terms of cost. Um, so home prices don't exactly match up with household growth um, that we observed um, in the census. Uh, we still see that Chittenden County is still the highest um, price area, the median home price being about $385,000 for a single family home, $425,000. Um, but um, nearby Franklin County has also been a hot market. But I think what this chart is also showing you is that the um, growth has been statewide. Um, and um, it's the highest increases are now actually being <laughs> incurred outside of Chittenden County. Um, so I think that really bears noting um, for, for a statewide alarm. In terms of uh, where we're seeing that growth, this is reiterating that fact, right? That before the pandemic, Chittenden County had the greatest price increases year over year, but now the greatest price increases are outside Chittenden County. And um, a lot of these towns tend to um, have a lot of seasonal um, tourism attraction associated with skiing, outdoor recreation and tourism. Uh, Minden, Dover, Ludlow, Warren, for example, Stowe has the highest medium home price um, in the state, $786,975 in 2021. Um, but we've seen growth in a lot of what we would say is non unexpected areas if you were looking at it as a statistician. Um, we can all make sense of it, but areas like Addison, um, a big increase in Barrie, um, North Hero, um, ones that we would not have predicted um, to see such spikes in maybe pre-pandemic. Sure. And that's showing out for what it's like buying a home. I think everybody's heard this story probably from a constituent that um, they go to make a bid on a home um, and either there's not one there or it's very quickly snatched up and homes move fast and that especially hurts buyers who are using government programs, who are using down payment assistance, you know, we can try to address this on the demand side by equipping low to moderate income buyers to go into the marketplace and compete. But when um, there's this much competition for homes, they're going to have a tough time getting a sales contract, quite frankly. Um, buyers are choosing or sellers are choosing high cash uh, buyers um, and it's making um, um, homes move even quicker. So uh, it's down to 69 days uh, on the market, which is the lowest since um, 2012. Then in terms of where we are seeing growth, uh, Vermont's population grew 2.8% between um, 2010 and 2020, right? This has been a consistent conversation. Um, we're ranked 40th in the nation in population growth according to the 2020 um, census. Um, we have a really small household size as well. So the rate of growth um, of household size was a, was a little greater. And what that means is um, we're, even though our rate, our, growth, our rate of growth is slow, we're still not building enough to keep up with the, uh, with the number of households coming in because our household size are also smaller. Uh, so if your population um, is divided among more households because you have a small household size. There's more two and three person than four and six person households. Um, that means that these, the numbers of around growth can actually be a little misleading about what pressure new in, influx of um, people coming to the community are. So, um, and again, we're seeing that statewide um, in terms of those pressures. And then construction's just, it, it's been fairly steady during the pandemic. You can see that level um, there. And we measure the success of whether or not there's confidence in the building market by a combination of how many um, permits um, are pulled and applied for, and then how many buildings actually go to start. Um, and I will say that one of the more um, concerning factors is we are seeing a widening gap between the number of permits that get pulled and the number of starts that actually happen we're always curious, what's the pull through rate of the people who obtain permits to actually get to a building getting built? Um, and that's a sign that in some cases, people are running into issues where they're turning around um, mid, mid development process and saying, I'm not doing this for various reason, price increases, or they run into regulatory challenges um, that they're, they're concerned about. And this is certainly a cyclical slide that um, we're, we're really concerned about too. And if you talk to a builder, um, this just goes round and round in circles. Um, builders will tell you, I can't find labor and I can't find labor because my labor can't find housing. And these are builders trying to build housing. Um, so we end up in this cycle where 
Um, Naylor and Breen's a great entity to call in if you want um, some, some really good com comments um, from a builder who's had that experience of trying to hire in tradespeople but not being able to find um, people willing to move to Vermont or lose people because they can't find housing themselves. So the people who build housing um, can't find housing and that's, that's a repetitive uh, issue that comes up. So unemployment rate in December, 2021 was 3.3%, which is down from a high of 15% in April of 2020. Um, so it's getting fairly close back up to um, pre-pandemic levels, but still not there. And nationally, the unemployment rate uh, was 3.9%. So we're still a little bit below that. But there are 32,490 fewer employed Vermonters working um, in December 2021 compared to December 2029. And that's a, that's a big number. Um, so uh, we think childcare and things like that have, have impacted that as well. Um, this was just a discussion that you all had and want to make sure to um, share this information with you. The out-of-state buyers um, are concentrated certainly among seasonal areas. Um, so that makes um, sense that we would see um, some of these increases occur, but out-of-state buyers uh, increased by 38% in 2020. So there is pressure on moving to Vermont. Um, understandable, a beautiful state and from a pandemic <clears throat> standpoint, um, people like the environment. Um, there are 19% of the homes in Vermont that are used seasonally or vacant for other reasons in 2020, um, according to our research. And then the short-term rentals, which tend to get a lot of focus just keep in mind um, that while that's that's an issue, that um, that housing stock remains less than 2.5% of the total units. So while it's true that short-term rentals uh, can put pressures in particular marketplaces, that there is um, there's also a reality that that's still a relatively small portion of the overall housing uh, stock in the state. Mm -hmm. And we, we can't um, move on without pointing out this disparity, which is um, another startling uh, number that the nation crossed overall, is that there's now over $9.9 .9 trillion in tappable home equity available for um, residents in the United States. And now it now um, supports about 30% of the typical household wealth uh, in the nation. Um, and as we think about equity, so we think about social and environmental justice, we do think that this is, this is a, um, a real call to action, this graph, um, when it comes to making sure that we're making investments that, that support equity and are focused on uh, racial and social justice as well. Um, because if you have an industry and or um, home ownership has created such a vast amount of wealth for so, so many Americans, and you have populations that have been blocked out from that, um, that's gonna be extremely detrimental to, their, to that, that, that uh, communities, those, those impacted individuals, uh, long-term economic financial health um, amongst other factors and issues. And then I wanna make sure to talk about the cost. Um, so we don't want it to be about cost, um, but the reality is, is whether we want it to be um, or not, it is. Um, and these numbers, I think, probably shock a lot of people. Um, but if we take a moment to think through it, the pandemic, again, has made um, conditions quite a bit worse. Between 2020 and 2021, um, the average cost of a proposed development um, of a Vermont affordable housing um, rental apartment um, rose by 9% um, to three, $333,000 33, per unit in terms of development costs. Um, in early, I'll say late 2021, um, in when we analyzed pre-applications, we had already seen um, a, a sizable jump from 333 to 347. Um, and now, um, as those same projects that expected to be 347, um, 347,000 per unit came to us um, in the fall, they're coming back in the spring and saying, actually, we've continued to work on cost numbers and this is where we think we are, um, $368,000 per unit um, being our average. Um, and again, um, we conducted some work and research to understand what types of items are really putting a lot of pressure um, on uh, builders and developers. Material and labor um, are absolutely the, the top items, um, but wanna point out that consistently um, we continue to hear back that predictable 
um, land use regulations um, are a real key to making sure that um, costs stay reasonable in the development of housing so we can be sure to hit our goals um, mm. and produce the housing that we need. So permitting continues to be an issue that comes up over and over again. I wanna pause um, just because I can jump into specific portions of the bill if you'd like me to. Um, you know, we've obviously been giving a lot of the testimony related to the missing middle proposal um, and also the uh, manufactured home community proposal um, and the first generation home buyer proposals. Um, and I know you've got some great experts in the room around um, land use regulation and some of the other components, but I, I wanna make sure I'm conscientious of time because I know you have a, a busy morning and see if you'd like me to touch on any of those other specific areas or, or have questions or comments we should talk about. Thank you for that. Um, uh, yes, so you were reading my mind, but that, so that was very, very helpful overview. I, I guess, I'm still trying to get, wrap my head around the the vacancy rate in Vermont and thirty. You just said thirty eight percent increase in out of state buyers. I'm not sure how many of those folks are calling Vermont home now, but um, I guess I, I'd like your thoughts on or if you know about how other states are addressing this, I know that the New York Times article was very enlightening and I, I did a search after that and found that the vacancy rates have really kind of escalated over time since about 1950. And I feel like we have have tax incentives in place for um, purchasing second homes or third or fourth homes. And um, if you have thoughts on that, I, I welcome them because I, I struggle um, with, the notion that we have a housing shortage. I understand we do. We, we have a housing crisis in terms of Vermonters needing homes, but um, somehow that's a big piece we need to integrate into the conversation. Yeah. So um, you're right that um, Vermont is second at a lot of stuff. Um, we are, I believe, the second, the second most rural state in the in the country, um, and I believe we also have right now the second oldest housing stock. So we do have a combination of both homes that are either owned as um, vacation homes that aren't occupied year round, but we also have just an old stock that's causing um, issues um, with, with keeping our stock the same number because those units go offline over time or become really expensive um, to maintain. So we hear a lot from um, banks that when their single family buyers are trying to purchase homes in some cases that were previously camps, that they're missing a lot of um, key components that help those homes um, be livable year round. Um, and that in a lot of cases, the homes need a good amount of work um, as well. Um, so on the range of homes that we're looking at, our focus has been on um, with the missing middle program and I think with the VHIP program, the idea has been to reinvest in existing stock too. So in addition to producing new homes, for example, the missing middle also allows for acquisition rehab where a builder can acquire a home um, that's not in great shape, um, make substantial improvements to it and sell it back to the market um, in, in, um, at a reasonable sales price. Um, I think I could also promise some follow-up. We'd be happy to take a look. I, I wanna admit to having not read that Times article, I've heard it referenced a few times, but I have not read it myself yet. Um, but I, uh, we can follow up maybe with some more thoughts for you, Chair, too, on, um, on that issue at large and see if we can put some actual Vermont data behind it. That would be helpful. I mean, it seems like we're talking about the incredible upward pressure in pricing and yet um, that pressures coming from, I'm, I mean, it has to be in large part from a 38% increase in out-of-state buyers. We already had probably a significant number of out-of-state buyers. So that's a, that's a big. But the one slide spot. showed that the percentage stayed the same. It's interesting. Kind of percentage of uh, vacancy of unoccupied, even, even with the increase in ownership, the vacancy rate stayed exactly the same as it was in 2010. Here, I think that's, it, so there's, it must be that people are actually moving here. Well, well it, because otherwise there's a- Yeah, so yeah. Um, Representative, I, I, I'd like to take you up on your offer. And I'm also interested to hear how other states are addressing this. Um, other states in particular with even greater housing pressure, California comes to mind. 
um, New York, we heard they have lower vacancy rates. Um, so anyway, Representative Dolan. Um, good morning and thank you. This is a very enlightening presentation. I appreciate it. I, I just want to mention uh, in, I'm from Washington seven districts, so the Mad River Valley and Duxbury and Moortown included. And uh, we have for the first time now experiencing where our housing, we've, we've passed the 50% mark in second homeowners. And many of them are actually being used for um, short-term rentals uh, when, when the owners of that second or third home is, is um, not using them. So I, I, um, I'm still concerned about that. I, instead of dismissing it as being only two and a half percent of the, of the <clears throat> issue, I think in some places where we're seeing a, a tremendous lack of available uh, housing that's affordable because of um, the second homeowner and the short-term market. So I only want to flag that because I think it's still, while statewide it may be small, it's still substantial in some parts of the state. And uh, we struggle with that because again, get, getting to your point, there's no housing for people who are living and working there that can help contribute and support the vibrancy of the local economies. Representative McCullough. Oh, sorry, I didn't know if that was a question. We do need to be sensitive to time. Sorry. Was there a question there? I'm just interested if you had a comment on that. I think that lines up with our, I, I, I would wonder how much of that has to do with the ski industry, because I think that does map to what we're seeing. Warren's listed as one of those communities that's had the greatest pressure um, in terms of, um, uh, of home prices at large. And then I would think it would probably map to that that idea that they've probably seen a higher influx of out-of-state buyers. Um, that 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 would map, and I would be curious as to how much of it was tied to the ski industry, quite frankly. Representative McCauley can be the last question. So it's a question first, and then a, a comment, which will not need a response. Thirty-two thousand plus Vermont workers, a reduction. The question is, are those all in the trades or is that across the board? Because that question really is directed at construction of housing. Yeah, that's that's a really good question that I do not have at my fingertips. Um, the last time that I had looked at it, um, it was trades heavy. Um, and that I will admit to saying was back when we did our survey of um, builders and developers. Um, so we had 60, a uh, total of 60 folks attend a forum about construction and um, development impact. And the feedback was that the cutoff that they were having trouble with was around $25 per hour. Any trade, any work that um, had wages below $25 per hour they were having um, a near impossible time recruiting people into those positions. Um, and this was in August, September of 2021 that we held those conversations. Um, mm. But I think it spoke to, they, they weren't having trouble hiring architects um, and um, engineers. There, were, there, was, there was nothing at that price point. It was, it was the labor area. Okay. Uh Thank you. That is important, and 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 perhaps you could layer the answer on to the chair's question uh, as you do research. And this is the comment, not requiring a comment by you. I find the Vermont Housing Finance Agency to be a reliable, uh, non-political source of information, data for us, with recommendations even. And I find your graph that plays the uh, political mantra of regulatory policy and permitting as being one of the monsters here. And it just is troubling coming from your department. I get it from other places, but not, I'm just saying. Thank you. If, if I could make just a quick yeah. comment to that. J just. A lot of what our job is to also talk to developers and builders in the field and report back their experiences. And I do, I do want to say that that those types of comments, you're right, are really hard to measure. 
Um, but they also, we also try to, when possible, bring back reflections from what we're hearing from the field. Um, and when we do the types of surveys um, that we do for builders to, to ask them about what, what they're experiencing, what their obstacles are, we feel like we have a responsibility to, to share some of that back. So I, I respect what you're saying, but, and also we try to do it as empirically as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. It was very helpful. And I would like to have you back um, for the further comments as we get more into the bill. Great, thank you. Honored to be here and appreciate your time. Thanks for all your work. All right, with that, we'll go to Chris Cochran. I'm Director of Community Planning and Revitalization. Good morning. Um, I'm also joined by Jacob Hemrick, um, who is our Director of Planning and Policy Man. <clears throat> is it okay if I stand? Because I can see the screen. I think I'm a little louder with a mask on if I stand. Is that all right? Sure. Fine. Okay. Um, so, um, first slide, please. Um, just a basic introduction slide. What I plan to do is just kind of give you. Um, Start with just an update on kind of where the bill is. It's still in the Senate, and it, it does face a lot of amendments. Um, give you a, many of you members are new. I haven't met enough many of you, but I haven't met all of you. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the designation programs, just to give you a little context. But it'll be quick. and then um, Jacob and I are going to jointly go back and forth. But we'll get into some of the why and some of the policy changes that we're we're, we're recommending here or supporting. Um, so I'm the director of community planning and revitalization. I think I have one of the better jobs in state government because we help communities, you know, we provide them the tools and resources they need to make our communities great and strong. And then Jacob. Um, yeah, and I'm a planning policy manage, manager in the Department of Housing Community Development. I manage some of the designation programs that we're gonna talk about, some grant programs, uh, support legislative work uh, for the administration. So, and I've served as a local planning commissioner on, in my volunteer. And volunteer roles as well. Yeah, I will add that he's the new new mayor of Barry too. Although he hates me to mention Not that. Not speaking <laughs> as, as mayor of Barry. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, like I said, we work uh, to provide tools and resources to communities. They do the work, um, but we're often the true leaders and kind of give them the framework um, to kind of make the changes we like to see in the landscape. Um, so, I think I think I watched a little bit of Alan's testimony yesterday. A lot of these things that you're looking at in this bill are repeats from last year. Um, bills, uh, S101 didn't make it across the finish line, but we were, we were, we were glad we were able to implement the bylaw modernization grants. We'll tell you more about that in a second. Um, but the root of this bill, um, was came, I think if you wanted to go back even further is S237. This was a bill from 2020. Um, and what it was, it, it was a lot of things. Um, but I think it struck a nerve with, um, municipal planners. Um, because it was a preemption bill. It said, you know, look, we want to support small compact, you know, we want to support compact growth in areas with sewer and water services. But many of our communities have large lot formats and we're just not getting good value out of these areas where we'd like to see housing go. There was a strong reaction to that in the House. It, it passed the Senate unanimously, but the House said, no, no local control. We need to be able to, you know, have respect communities' decisions. Um, and it was controversial. Um, so what a bill that came over that was 60 pages, I think ended up passing in about 20 pages. So it made some good changes, but it didn't, um, the preemption language, language failed. But it did start strike up a good conversation with municipalities about where do we want housing to happen? What, are we, what can we do to be more welcoming to communities to create more housing options in these desirable locations close to amenities, shops, resources, stores, et cetera? Um, and that's where Representative Baumgarts came in. Um, he hosted a housing forum or conference in his region with Representative James, um, convened a lot of stakeholders to talk about the housing problems in his region. Um, um, following up on that conference, it's always great when you follow up and you actually wanna do something to actually make a difference. So we heard a lot of about the challenges. Um, he convened a group of us, um, um, stakeholders including um, the department, VNRC, um, Regional Planning Commissions and the Vermont Planners Association to work on a bill that kind of responded to a memo that they had sent to many legislators about, you know, really the problem is not at the municipal level. The state can make a lot of changes to the designation programs to make it easier for small towns in particular to qualify for the state designation programs, particularly around housing. Um, so that was where we started. Um, we met several times, they were great meetings. I complained to Seth, I'm like, I wish we could do this faster, but I think we had five meetings over the fall. 
Um, and we worked collaboratively to kind of narrow down the scope, come to agreement on a bill that became 511. I think, um, what do you have, 19 co-sponsors in addition to you and Rep. James, so it's well supported. Um, ultimately, 511 didn't start in the House. Um, it started in the Senate. So Senator Sorokin, in his omnibus housing bill, took in many of the provisions in H511 and kind of rolled them in, in, into this bill. And so this is the first couple sections of the bill that, you're, that we're talking about now. Um, since then, you know, many of our other partners have, have weighed in on the bill, VHCB, VHFA, VLCT, and others, you know, came in and supported the bill because we all see this as a housing crisis that we're trying to solve and the bill is responsive to those concerns. The Senate also added complementary provisions that you've seen before, S101, um, to make it easier for communities um, to qualify for these designations. Um, right now, it's in the Senate still. We expect it will go onto the floor today for second reading. Several amendments are proposed. I think Ellen gave you the heads up on that. The most significant one that I expect is all of S210, which was the rental registry um, and the VHIP program to improve um, housing that's offline will get pulled into that bill. Um, so it's a really, it's a big monstrous, you know, omnibus housing bill that's coming your way. Mm -hmm. um, third reading is probably gonna be Thursday or Friday. So I think it'll be in the house next week, maybe even sooner. All right, any questions there? Is that enough of a background? All right, next slide, please. Um, so a little bit of kind of why we do this and kind of what we've done. This is a picture of Bristol from the late or early 90s um, um, with uh, kind of close work with our partners at the Preservation Trust of Vermont Beach and others. We all recognize that this is not the image we want to project um, to visitors and this is not a place that um, says they're strong and prosperous. Next slide, please. And this is what Bristol looks like today. And you know, this is 30 years of hard work a lot of state investment. And what we try to do in our office is align our state funding um, with regulations to kind of create the outcomes we need today to create strong and vibrant communities. Next slide. Um, and this is what we want to, want to see in many of our communities. The pandemic has certainly set us back, um, but I think everybody's aching to go downtown or to their village center to meet their neighbors and convene and have fun. Um, and this is, you know, while we don't have billboards in the state, I think this is the best advertisement we could ever have for Vermont and why it is a great place to live and come to work. Next slide. We do this by focusing on a few different types of designations. One is our downtowns. These are, you know, our larger principal communities. There's 23 of these. Um, and if they're strong and vital, um, this is what this is what helps us draw new people to the state. Our businesses are, need people here to fill their jobs, but we can't give them the housing they need um, to fill these positions. So it's kind of this, a little bit of the problem Seth said, you know, it's like we need more people, but we can't house them. And um, until we figure out how to house them, can we solve these problems? Next slide. Villages are also really important to us, um, but they're definitely smaller scale. You know, they don't have the central business district like the downtowns do. Um, and this is really gets at the heart of what S226 is trying to do. We're trying to make the state designation programs, particularly the neighborhood area designation, easier for our small towns. And I'm gonna pause there and then turn over the talking stick to Jacob, unless there's questions. Let's keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, Senator um, uh, hit on a point that something I've been thinking about for now, probably since the start of the pandemic, if not before, a lot of commercial space including offices that people may have had uh, worked at before are never going back to because of our new paradigm. Yep. And those places are prime <laughs> residential housing. And I will also say they are prime for um, prime for Act 250 because they're likely permitted through Act 250. And will be an opportunity through Act 250 to say some certain percent shall be affordable. <laughs> what happened? How did that gem get taken out of the bill? I, I think there's still, um, am I wrong? I think there's a commercial conversion provision, um, but there's also the downtown tax credits um, that can be used to convert you know, a, a vacant commercial building into housing. 
Yeah, I, I'll need to research that a little bit more, yeah. but the senators seem to think it was scrubbed. I, I don't think that's correct, but I'll double check. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. We need people to count on to support our shops and businesses. You know, many people are now comfortable shopping online, and we need to figure out how we can get more people into our, to our downtown areas, living full time to support our small businesses. Those, and the owners of those projects need that kind of support. Yep. Thank you. High level questions. We we don't have a bill it's being amended, so if we can stick to yeah, yeah. big picture, that would be great. High level doesn't have to be answered now, but at some point in the bill a talk there's an overlap between uh permitting for water wastewater mm -hmm. with state and local and it eliminates as i understand the draft eliminates the state as opposed to the other way around we'd mm -hmm. be streamlining it but still having state oversight so you don't have to answer it now but that's one area i'd like to get a little more clarity okay the next slide chris has talked about uh downtowns and villages in the next uh designation as we think about um the the built environment is neighborhoods, the various surrounding downtowns and villages. And the housing crisis has really brought a lot of attention to these areas and creating more opportunities for people to live in and around downtowns and villages is not only an important strategy to meet our economic and environmental goals, but also our land use goals and our smart growth principles. So you heard Seth talk about policy alignment and S226 really works to align state and local regulations with new funding to increase housing opportunities and choice in good locations uh, in the neighborhoods surrounding downtowns and villages where they're convenient, close to jobs, um, libraries, uh, where transit can work. Next slide. So we have five state designations. You can see there are 262 right now, 221 village centers, 23 downtowns, two new town centers, 10 neighborhood development, areas and six growth centers. These are, were all created at different times over the past 25 years to address different concerns, ranging from vacant and underused buildings like the picture you saw in Bristol within a downtown to housing, to managing and planning for future growth. So we've seen a 100% increase in villages in the past five years and interest is starting to build with the neighborhood development area designation program. Next slide. Well, while many of the communities are designated, a total area of the designation is really quite small, one 355th of the total land area of the state of Vermont. So here you can see this, the area of the state of Vermont compared to the actual areas that are, that are designated throughout the state. Next slide. And, uh, and if just looking at one of those designations, you can see that uh, you know, the, the downtown designation, 50% of those are in the 50 to 100 acre range. And these are examples of uh, Burlington's designated downtown and Bristol's designated downtown. So when we're talking about this area, we're really talking about just the civic and commercial core of a community. Uh, not necessarily what may, people might have in mind when they think about um, the, when they, they when they picture their downtown and their community. And when de development occurs in these compact centers, they achieve really what planners refer to as location efficiency. There are places where transit can actually work because there's enough, enough activity to sustain and support a bus stop. There where people have active transportation op options like walking and biking um, and where they don't have to risk their life to get from here to there. And there were public and services and infrastructure are more affordable to deliver. And that helps deliver on um, housing affordability. That's more rate payers per linear foot of water line. That's more households to to help underwrite the cost of a sidewalk and, if, and where more school children can be clustered, help save on that fuel budget that you see in the school, the school budget each year. Next slide. And back to Chris. Oh, this was my summer. Uh, Vermont Climate Council. Woohoo! Oh my God. I got so tired of Zoom. But uh, <laughs> really important work, but there was a lot of meetings. Um, um, but I was glad ACCD was there to represent, you know, um, our settlement pattern and land use because it's a key component of how we're going to tackle our climate change or how we're going to reduce our emissions. Um, in that land use, it's really hard to really support um, the compact settlements that, that actually reduce the vehicle miles traveled. If you live closer to where you work or go to school, you don't have to drive as much. And this committee, I'm sure well knows, vehicle miles traveled are our highest source of emissions in the state. After that, it's, it's heat, um, fuel for homes. Um, so this is why the council 
recommended many changes to support compact settlements. Um, and a key chief among them was the downtown and village center tax credits. This is a great program that you know improves um, existing buildings um, in and around our downtown areas, um, brings them back online, uses, fills those vacant upper floors. Um, but what they recommended doing, and this is what included in S226, is an expansion of the tax credits to the neighborhood um, areas that surround the downtown. So Jacob is going to talk a little bit about how these different um, designations work together. But really, the health of our downtowns is really tied, tightly linked to the health of our neighborhoods. Um, so we really need to figure out how we can make um, improvements to the existing housing stock. Many of Vermonters, we all live in large homes. As Seth said, we're, our household sizes are very small. So how can we create more housing opportunities in these bigger buildings? Um, so this is one of the things that the tax credits hopes to do. And there's also a provision in this, um, in this bill that creates a, a $5 million program for accessory dwelling units. Um, these are great opportunities, I think, to help older people who need as another source of income um, to stay in their homes and create an opportunity for a younger person to come live in a downtown and maybe have one less car. Next slide. Um, we all know, we all talk about Vermont's traditional settlement pattern of compact centers surrounded by rural countrysides. This is the picturesque Vermont that we all know and love. Um, cars kind of came onto the landscape and kind of changed that. Um, next slide. Um, and it allowed kind of a lot of rural and dispersed housing development um, that many people don't like. Um, and Act 250, as we know, is not a great tool to control this type of rural small scale development because of its jurisdictional thresholds. It's cheaper often to develop houses in the countryside because they don't have to deal with the same issues that you do in a center. They don't have contaminated soils. They have fewer neighbors. They don't have to deal with staging and redirecting traffic. They don't have to coordinate their infrastructure investment. So it can be very expensive to build in these centers and that tends to drive um, um, a lot of development to uh, rural areas. Um, and this, of course, you know, increases uh, forest fragmentation and, and increases parcelization. Next slide, please. And we, we have research that shows that if you live in a, in a compact center, you actually drive a whole lot less. Um, and transportation is not cheap, especially these days. I filled up my car tank the other day and almost paid $100. Um, but in addition to cost, it's just not fun when you have to spend all your time traveling. It has an impact on your family, it has an impact on your waistline. Um, and you know, <laughs> to the extent that we can create more opportunities for people to live in a, in a downtown and village center and have fewer cars and spend less time in the cars, we can save people money and improve their quality of life. However, um, next slide, please. Um, the cost of transportation, you know, you've all heard the phrase, you know, drive until you qualify, you know, if you, you know, the houses are cheaper in the countryside, um, but the cost of transportation, if you add into it, um, you know, cost of owning your car and maintaining your car and the fuel you need in your car often um, uh, makes a downtown residence more, you know, more attainable um, and actually can cost the same. Next slide. The problem is, is we don't have very many opportunities. Many people would like to live in these amenity rich areas. They're just not the housing supply, as you saw from Seth, to satisfy the market's needs. I'll stop there and turn it over to Jacob. The next slide. So as this committee is well aware, a lot of our planning framework and uh, that was built occurred during the 1970s. And so, and that includes a lot of municipal zoning bylaws. There's a lot of 1970s thinking when household composition was very different than it is today. 70% of Vermont's households are now one and two person households. That's 70% of households only have one or two, two people in them. And, and suburban zoning, like we see in, 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 in municipal bylaws around the state, typically requires larger lots, wider roads, mandates a development pattern that is more auto-oriented. And this type of zoning can also make the traditional pattern that's on the ground right now non-conforming and harder to adapt over time. These, these types of patterns limit transportation options. It doesn't use our infrastructure and uh, 
and, and land efficiently, and it can certainly harm the vitality of tra traditional centers as it leads to a reliance on single occupancy vehicles. So many Vermont communities continue to have single family zoning, but we're really excited to have the bylaw modernization grants from last year's budgets rolling out right now, $500,000 uh, work uh, going to work in 41 towns who are currently updating their zoning in and around centers. Now that's about 20% of the total communities with zoning and subdivisions bylaws, looking for opportunities to welcome homes and open new opportunities in smart locations. Um, the Senate hopes to allocate another $650,000 uh, to continue that program and to help even more towns adapt their municipal bylaws from um, some of the 1970s standards that are working against the goals that we have today. Next slide. I, how many towns don't have zoning and uh, subdivision bylaws? Uh, off the top of my head, I guess about 20, 20%. So. Do not have them. Do not, yeah. we, We've recently learned 128 towns are one acre towns for Act 250 purposes. 128. Okay. That's a lot. And, and often it's because they don't have zoning and subdivision bylaws. I haven't dug into that yet, but that's something we be, we would like more information on. Yeah, absolutely. And we can we have a one resource that the department maintains is a... Um, uh, a planning atlas, where we up, which we update every September based on data fed to us from the regional planning commissions. Um, there's a data layer on there that shows uh, what, what we, uh, what the RPCs report out as municipalities having zoning and subdivision or unified uh, bylaws, and so you can see a map of the state of Vermont. And we can get that to you, Chair Sheldon. That'd be great. I think it also it does one acre, ten acre towns too, so you can have it all in one place. I think that's what I've been looking at. So that would be helpful though. To... I do think over 90% have at least flood hazard bylaws to qualify for flood flood insurance. So you know better than I. <laughs> <laughs> would, yeah. uh, so you may have seen that Seven Days is doing a series right now called about the housing crisis called Locked Out. And we expect that there's going to be an article uh, coming out shortly about the work happening with the bylaw modernization grants. Um, there's also one that talks about uh, this bill, Senate Bill 226, and how it could help create uh, more housing and centers. Next slide. So just to bring, this, bring the message home about neighborhoods, having more people living in and around villages and downtowns is really critical to meeting the state's environmental goals and keeping young Vermonters here and drawing new, new families and businesses to Vermont. So despite the, the really incredibly successful work of many of our partners to increase the supply of affordable housing in Vermont, the gap between the need and availability of housing really stubbornly persists. And that gap will grow without sustained and increased investments in housing. Um, so next slide. So just to break down the neighborhood development area uh, program, which is uh, which several sections of this bill touch on, um, again, the downtown and village center uh, designation is the core designation and the neighborhood development area builds on that by looking at a half mile radius around downtowns or a quarter mile radius around uh, village centers and new town centers. So it's designating that area within walking distance to the center. Next slide. As part of this program, we look at the local bylaws um, to make sure that they're welcoming, uh, uh, welcoming homes in and around those centers, including the density, the building design, the transportation network, complete streets, and natural resource avoidance in those areas. Next slide. This The bill proposes to remove uh, the water and wastewater infrastructure prerequisite for the neighborhood development area program. And this would make uh, more villages working on community septic of, of eligible for designation. So these are just two examples. One is Jericho, they're both in Chittenden County. One is Jericho, one is Westford, uh, a, a small village. Um, Next, uh, next to Milton North of Essex, um, these are this is the type of build-out pattern that could could be supported with a community septic in this unsewered village. And Westford is now has been actively working on a community septic to support development in and around their village center. Next slide. Uh, another example is uh, is Manchester. Here you can see their sewer service area map in the red area. And there were, there were areas um, that could have been included in the town of Manchester's neighborhood development area designation, but it was not yet within the sewer service area. Um, and, and, all, and they're planning for 
uh, uh, sewer sewer expansions, but it also would mean that there are areas that potential developers could look at for uh, for an in-ground system to support cluster development uh, that would be enabled by the municipal bylaws to do that compact development served by complete streets that has the density, um, that has the building uh, built pattern that the, that the program looks for and the stage prioritizing. Next slide. Oh, and the other direction. And just a, just a, here's an example of a decentralized wastewater system. Sometimes these are much uh, more affordable than big pipe solutions and designating unsewered areas, such as the bill suggests, gets the local planning framework in place to support cluster development and support that can be supported by shared septic system. And these, these types of system would still remain subject to a state water wastewater permit and open more areas for pre-development due diligence to invite a developer to look at those sites uh, for prospective development. And I know you talked about yesterday, uh, next slide, <coughs> some of the uh, river corridor and flood hazard uh, provisions of the bill. S-226 <coughs> would refine how the program recognizes what's, uh, how municipalities are regulating locally to protect for flood ready development. And so river corridors protect the meander belt of the river. And you can see in this Manchester case again, uh, where the NDA has excluded the river corridor <clears throat> and, and the flood hazard area. Uh, but, um, but, and, and I'll, I'll just add that the neighborhood development area uh, was built right after Irene. And since that time, the Agency of Natural Resources has developed much more robust uh, model bylaws uh, for responsible, uh, re respond flood ready and responsible development um, in those areas. Next slide. And so this is an example where Manchester is working hard to try to figure out how to provide uh, housing that's affordable to people in the 120% to 250% area media income. So workforce housing in, in and around their village center and this is a parcel there that currently hosts three structures. Um, it's uh, it's within the flood hazard area, and they would like to put, uh, build a partnership for 40 units at the rear of that parcel. Um, but delivering on the affordability measures um, is very difficult without the neighborhood development area designation. That's because it's, it becomes eligible for the priority housing project exemption from Act 250. A&R fees are capped at uh, $50 um, there. So those benefits help deliver affordability. The other thing that delivers affordability is that this area is already served by municipal infrastructure. There's streets, there's water, there's sewer. Uh, they're, they're the typical services that the municipality provides that supports, um, that supports affordability, housing affordability. Uh, next slide. So Seth talked about you know right buildings, right places. This is an example of a building in uh, in Winooski. And what what this bill really gets at, and you spoke to yesterday, is the balance between uh, protection of river corridors and flood hazard areas outside compact centers, while allowing flood flood ready development and responsible development in centers uh, where there's existing infrastructure and uh, and where. Uh, people can live closer to jobs and services. All right, I'm stretched. But not right, everybody. There. <laughs> I do have a time constrained witness that I wouldn't mind if it would might be a little awkward, but if we could switch to him, and then I don't think you all are as time constrained. Am I am I right about that? Um, Someone who has to leave at ten thirty. I need. I think it'll be pretty. I'd like just just. It's a kind of a strange switch, but I think it would be helpful. <laughs> so it's Graham Campbell. Um, our fiscal analyst from Joint Fiscal Office on a memo for us on second home stuff. So sorry for the segue, but I want to respect Graham's time and I also want to have, have him have enough time. Thank you, Madam <clears throat> Chair. For the record, I'm Graham Campbell from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, I prepared a presentation that it's more or less the, the memo that I shared with Madam Chair um, like earlier this week about the tax, uh, things in the tax code that might benefit second home ownership in Vermont. Um, and I've also laid out some considerations. And so I'll go ahead and share that um, and start the slideshow here. And maybe change this to this. Can everyone see this presentation so far? We can, but we're seeing it as, oh, there we go. That's good. Perfect. Okay, so um, I'll try to 
blitz through this because of my time constraints here. So just some quick background. We know that Vermont has a lot of second slash seasonal homes, although the, the definition for these, as I'll touch upon, is, is really kind of uh, not standardized across lots of different data sources and you know tax department etc but according to the 2020 census over 55,000 house sites were classified as um, either seasonal recreational or occasional use it was about 16.6 percent of total house sites now that's that's a classification within a sort of larger classification called vacant homes within the census. Vacant homes includes things like seasonal recreational occasional use homes, but it includes things like homes for sale, just homes that are not being lived in, um, and, and other types of dwellings that are just not occupied. <laughs> so just to give you a sense of how that's evolved in Vermont, we, all, we have had a lot of vacant homes for a long time. Um, in the 2000 census, about 18.2% mm -hmm. of house sites were vacant homes. Um, and then in the 2020 latest census, about 18.6% of house sites were vacant homes. So um, to the extent that um, it sort of feels very acute right now that second homes or recreational homes are, are crowding out the housing stock, that you know, could have been potentially the case back in 2000 because roughly the same percentage of total house sites were um, second homes. Another measure that um, I see cited a lot is from this IPX 1031 um, property management firm, which estimates 17% of homes in Vermont are vacation homes, is the second in the country after Maine. But the issue is that second home has so many definitions across lots of different places, but the, generally the census definition here is just very broad. It's a seasonal, it's a temporary, it's an occasional or recreational home, but that doesn't necessarily mean a home that is suitable <laughs> for a person or family to occupy year round. So it includes detached homes that you know have all the necessary requirements for living in includes you know condos um seasonal apartments um at ski resorts camps lake houses cottages and so you know things like camps and lake houses or cottages um you know some of those things might not have insulation or heat or might be on a concrete slab or not suitable for all, all year round but the census and a lot of the data sources that i've seen classify those types of things as sort of second home so i guess my the point of this slide is to sort of say just because you're seeing a number that says something like 60,000 homes in Vermont are vacant, that doesn't necessarily mean that all those homes are <laughs> accessible for housing supply, um, because a lot of those are not um, really suitable for year round living. So to give you a, to dive more into the tax side of things, um, second homes aren't classified um, in Vermont. Um, in any sort of formal way. Um, basically the way it works is any home, anything that is a home, a residence that is not a homestead is considered non-homestead property and they pay the non-homestead property tax. But non-homestead, so that would include things like second homes or seasonal rentals, but it also includes everything else, commercial, industrial, business properties, farms, um, open land, timber land, et cetera. That's considered all non-homestead properties. But within all the uh, the categories there are are all within all known homestead and non homestead there are 18 different property categorizations and four of those are what's called R1 and R2 which is the residential property which R1 is residences under 6 acres and R2 is over 6 acres and seasonal properties seasonal properties same sort of split on acreage 6 acres and under and over 6 acres and so the first gut is to say well look at S1 and S2. Those are our best proxy for what is second home ownership Vermont. If we wanted to do something tax-wise, we could just identify the S1s and S2s and put the tax on them. Well, S1 and S2 properties are generally those that are really seasonal um, and deemed seasonal by the assessor of the property at the local level. So, you know, I've been told by the tax department, it has these houses have specific characteristics like a lack of insulation, a lack of heat, sometimes lack of running water in the house. Um, or toilet, they're on a concrete slab, things like that, things that are not suitable for residential dwellings. So the problem when we talk about second homes is while we have a classification for seasonal homes, things about things like residential homes in say Stowe or Woodstock or other ski towns or gold towns that look and you know for all intents and purposes are homes 
those are just getting classified as residential properties. There's no way to really identify those types of second homes. Um, so that's more or less the, my, what I'm saying at the end of the slide here is the Department of Taxes was asked last year to look at, you know, how can we identify second homes within the tax structure, the existing property tax? And they basically said there's no way, great, no great way to do it um, because we don't collect that information. Wait, sorry, Graham. I think I'm missing something. Why wouldn't R1 and R2 capture those? Because R1 and R2 capture every, any normal type of home. Um, they don't, you know, so. But they're vacant. I mean, if they're not, if they're non-homestead, no, they're not used year round. It's true, but I don't, uh, I don't know whether like R1 and R2, like for instance, someone might be not living in the house for one year and not file a homestead declaration, in which case it would sort of look like a vacant home, but then the next year move back and then become a, a, you know, a homestead property. So um, I understand the question. It's, I just think that the tax department does not as it's currently set up, have a great way to sort of handle all the nuances um, between or correctly identify what is what we typically think of as a second home that is vacant for only the purposes of a vacation or only a part-time residence. Uh, Representative Dolan. Uh, good, good morning and thank you for this presentation. It's an important one. What about um, backing it, uh, going um, backing up in that definition? You can, ex you can exclude the commercial industrial businesses, farms, and what you would be left with is the potential non-homestead seasonal or second homes, and then put the burden on the property owner to demonstrate uh, whether it's a you know permanent home or not. But in that way, if you could separate out that non-homestead category, you can then potentially use the, a differential in tax rate to uh, help clarify and target um, a, uh, those homes that are second homes. Yeah, I, I understand the question. Um, I would really encourage you all to have the tax department to come in and talk about the nuances of property valuation, but I'll give you an example of the nuance here that's really difficult. Suppose, you know, I am a Vermont owner of a four- a four unit apartment building. Okay. And I basically, I own the building, but then I sell sh shares of that building to individuals from out of state who use those condos or apartments within the property as seasonal rentals themselves. How, how would that get handled in a situation where we're trying to target second homes? Um, so I, I would really encourage the committee, if they're interested, to look at their to have the tax department, particularly the property evaluation review team, come in and talk about some of the issues and to overview their report. Okay. Thank you. So, so, so I was asked to look at basically whether the the tax codes federally in Vermont have um, sort of incentives for second homes or tax benefits for second homes. And generally what I found, and based upon my knowledge, that the federal and Vermont tax codes do not have a strict definition of second home or vacation home. Um, so again, we're, we're talking about the issues definition. So most of the time we're talking about the distinguishing factor is between a primary residence and then everything that's not a primary residence. Um, and there's not something that's called that says, well, if you have a vacation home, then here's how it gets treated, et cetera. Um, so Overall, there are few to no provisions in either the Vermont or federal tax code that benefits second homes relative to the primary homes. So basically, there's nothing in the code that says if you have a second home, you get this tax incentive. But if you have a primary home, that primary home doesn't get the incentive. What more likely you see is second homeowners can utilize the tax benefits that are available to real estate and primary residence holders in the tax code. So to give you some of the, the, the big ones here. In the federal tax code, the biggest one is within itemized deductions. And I'm sure this, um, many on the committee are, are aware of the home mortgage interest deduction that's available for owners of um, primary and secondary residences. But basically what it means is an individual can deduct the cost of interest on their mortgages up to $750,000 in debt. So if you have one house and you don't hit the $750,000 in debt, threshold or ceiling, then you can use, you can start deducting on your second home. 
The second thing is the state and local tax deduction, where prop um, taxpayers can deduct the, the taxes paid on a first or second home property taxes, but they're subject to a ten thousand dollar cap, and that also includes state and local income taxes and sales taxes. So, you know, for someone with a second home in Vermont, they're almost certainly going to. Um, you know, likely hit the $10,000 cap and not be able to deduct the entire cost of both or the property tax cost of all. Um, and if someone's living in Vermont, then they would have to essentially choose how they want to split up that $10,000 or they want to use it for income taxes or they want to use it for property taxes on their first or seasonal homes. Um, but the key thing here that I want to flag is that these deductions are most likely, probably more likely to benefit or second homeowners homeowners are likely to benefit from these disproportionately because um, in order to itemize your deductions, you're most, you, you have to have sort of higher income. Generally, higher income um, households are much more likely to itemize um, federally and, you know, basically what we see in Vermont returns. Um, and it stands to sort of more reason that someone with higher income can afford a second house. And so there's no data on it, but sort of theoretically, because um, second homeowners are more likely to have higher income than low income um, homeowners, um, then they're more likely to be able to access these deductions. The second I want to touch upon is deductions for rental property. So if someone's running a second home like a rental property, aka having receiving rental income from it, they can deduct the mortgage interest cost and the taxes paid as deductible expenses under the federal tax code, and just like any other business would. So don't think about it as something that's like, you know, second home second homes get this special treatment. This is just any business that has property. Um, and pays taxes would get the ability to deduct um, their, you know, their mortgage interest cost if they were buying sort of a an industrial building, for instance, or any state and local taxes paid. The third is capital gains. There are two levels of of treatment on at uh, in capital gains. The first is the capital gains exclusion for a primary residence. It's five hundred thousand dollars for a married couple. So if you have capital gains. If you make money on your primary residence, you sell it, the first $500,000 are excluded from taxable income. If the owner lives in a second home for the past two of the five years, they can claim that exclusion because then it, your, that house is considered a primary residence. If it's strictly a second residence where the owner is not living in the second home, they're not eligible to take that capital gains exclusion. The second is for second homeowners who do old capital gains, there are lower rates on capital gains relative to other income. So I'm wary of my time constraint here at 1030. So I'm wondering whether I should pause here and finish up at a different time or, um, yeah. or yeah. whether I should um, try to ask the Ways and Means Committee whether they can give me another 15 minutes. <laughs> this is ways and means. No. <laughs> um, maybe, yeah. Let me let me see if I can ask Sorsha. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna. Wait to hear back if I can continue here because I'd hate to stop. <laughs> um, where was I? So moving on to the Vermont tax code, Vermont really does not offer any sort of specific tax incentives to um, second homeowners that don't apply to primary homeowners on the income tax side. The only couple that I would identify is first, there's federal deduction flow through. So because Vermont starts its age, its personal income tax code at AGI, adjusted gross income, um, if a second homeowner is using that property as a business, like a rental property, that, and deducts mortgage and, and tax expenses, that deduction happens before adjusted gross income, and therefore that, that sort of deduction flows through to Vermont. Does everyone kind of understand how that works? So we're essentially taking a, a line off of the federal return that asks you what your income is, but income 
is defined as wages, salaries, you know, um, business income, social security, et cetera. And um, business income is net of any deductions. The second one is the capital gains exclusion. Vermont, Vermont sort of picks up that capital gains exclusion for the sale of primary residences um, that is at the federal level. So if you are excluding um, the sale of your primary residence um, from your capital gains, then Vermont picks that up. Um, but then Vermont has a specific exclusion of $5,000 um, that you can subtract from your capital gains um, for the sale of a residence if you're not if you're paying tax capital gains on it. So it's not specific to second or first homes. It's not specific to it's really just any capital gain that you can deduct five thousand dollars from your income. So if you're a second homeowner and you have you're paying capital gains, then you can deduct five thousand dollars from it from your income for Vermont. Moving on to the property tax. So as I said earlier, second homes are classified as non-homestead property and for the property tax system. Generally, we try to keep those, the legislature tries to keep those rates pretty close to each other. And when there are changes in the rates each year, there's an attempt to keep the changes, you know, the, the percentage change equal between homestead and non-homestead to prevent distortions. So to give you a sense, fiscal year 22 homesteads, the average homestead rate state, why was $1.52. And it was a dollar sixty one for non homestead property. So it's not as if you know homesteads are getting a much bigger break with a lower tax rate on average than non homesteads. The second thing is that homestead owners benefit you know significantly from the property tax credit, and second homeowners do not because second homeowners and non homestead property are not eligible for the property tax credit. So um, in general, the property tax credit is a huge tax relief program for homeowners, primary homeowners. It's about 170, not $170 per year. That's a mistake. $170 million per year. So <laughs> um, sort of wrapping up the tax, you know, summary here. These are sort of others that I, I highlighted. Um, the first is the use value appraisal program, which this committee I'm sure knows a lot about. With sec second homeowners with large land holdings could benefit from the use value appraisal program, but it's not really a special benefit, as you know, relative to a primary homeowner. So if a primary homeowner has a house site and has a lot of land, they can benefit from um, the use value appraisal program, um, just like a second homeowner would if it's you know, just, the ownership really doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but we don't have any data on the number of parcels enro enrolled in the unit use value appraisal program that are that contain a house site and it is owned by a non-resident owner. Um, so it's just sort of a we think there this could be a tax benefit for second homeowners, but it's not special for them specifically, and we don't really know what the scale is. The final one is the property transfer tax. This is a tax paid on the transfer of property by deed or controlling interest uh, when you buy a house um, or buy any type of property in Vermont. It is paid by the buyer unless otherwise uh, negotiated between the seller and the buyer. And the buyers and the sellers indicate what they intend to use the property for. So I think this is a sort of, you know, a, a good area for use for future study about, you know, you know how many property transfers we see that go from someone who is using the house for a um, for a primary residence that sells it to someone who plans to use it for a secondary residence, a seasonal home. Um, so, because that'll give us a sense of whether there is housing stock being removed or being added, basically, if someone's taking a seasonal home and turning into a primary residence, um, being added or removed from the housing stock. But basically, if the transfer is using it for a pro principal residence, they pay in a lower effective tax rate. You can see in the table below, if you are um, using the, if it's the, the buyer is using it for a principal residence, they pay 0.5% on the first $100,000 in value transferred. And then they pay 1.25% on the value over $100,000 plus the 0.2% clean water surcharge. But 
If it's not a principal residence, so all other, so that would include the transfer of a sec for a second home, they would pay 1.25% on the entire piece plus the 0.2% um, the clean water surcharge on the entire purchase price of the home. So in this case, it is, it is a tax benefit to you know, use a property for a principal residence. So I'll wrap up here by just talking about some considerations for, you know, committees, this committee or other committees when thinking about how to tax second homes. Um, as I said earlier, the definition of a second home is very nuanced. Is it, does it just mean a vacant home or are we talking about vacant homes that have all the necessary requirements for living in? So, you know, there are, you know, probably close to 20,000 at least seasonal homes um, in the state of Vermont that are classified by the Department of Taxes as being seasonal and therefore like having things like no heat or um, not having running water, having a concrete slab really suitable for only seasonal use. So our, if there is a tax to try to incentivize people to put more or to bring more housing stock back or into sort of the fold, then it's important to identify what exactly the target is. Because if, if it's sort of a broader sort of seasonal, you know, occupied versus non-occupied classification, then there's a good chance that, you know, this tax, a tax would end up being applied to, you know, things like a cottage or a lake house or something like that, that is not necessarily, you know, taking housing away from the housing stock per se. And so if we're talking about using the tax code to help incentivize houses being brought back into sort of the primary re residence fold, do we build a new tax system or do we use an existing tax system? So if we're looking at the property tax, I think the Department of Taxes touches upon this in their report that they published, and I can send that to, to Lizzie for the committee to have, but it would probably require some sort of declaration every year um, of a non-occupied house site similar to the homestead declaration. So basically someone would have to say or tell us what they're using the house for. Um, Cause we, under the current system, it is, there's just too many nuances to get a sense of what a, a parcel is being used for. Um, and that's the department of taxes reading. But even if there is a, a declaration compliance and administration are sort of issues there. So how do you treat, how do you ensure that out of state residents, out of state um, taxpayers are filing the declaration, you know, and how, how do we make sure that the Department of Taxes and municipalities, if municipalities are going to be administering this partly, um, how do we make sure that they have the resources and expertise and understanding of the law to administer this type of tax? The second option is the income tax. And I would say that the Vermont income tax does not offer much in the form of incentives to really take away or change um, for for second homes. Most of the benefits are federal in nature, and it's not like Vermont can require someone to add back a federal tax thing that they've taken because of Vermont's tax code, I think, to the to a, to a positive direction is delinked from the federal tax code. So if there was, you know, something on the income tax, it would have to be something, I think, relatively new, you know, something like, you know, if you have a second home in Vermont, then you have to pay an extra 1% on your income tax, which I think would be rather confusing and funky to, to, um, to carry out. The third is the property transfer tax. And in my reading, this is probably the easiest, more straightforward, because we know what the buyer and the seller, like right now under the current form, buyers and sellers list what they're using the property for. So we have a good sense of what the houses, the property being transferred um, is being used for. So it's kind of, we have sort of a, a already baked in system, but the issue with the property transfer tax, or I don't know if it's an issue, but it's really only collected once when the property is transferred. So if the goal is to, I guess, disincentivize keeping a home vacant, then this wouldn't sort of do the trick. Um, it would essentially just generate a source of revenue from people who are um, buying a, ho a residential home for the purposes of second home to you know, generate money for some other purpose. Um, 
And a quick summary of what other states do. So this is this is my research. Um, so I, I don't want to say this is completely exhaustive, but you know I've spent some time looking at this in response to Madam Chair's request. But we could not find a state tax that is on sp second home specifically. Um, it, it, a most state, all states really do not have a state property tax. Um, except for really Vermont. So it's, it would be difficult to find one even within a state context, but even within cities, this doesn't appear to be, or towns does not appear to be something that is um, um, that done nationally. The only exception I could find was Washington DC. Um, and they lever a higher property tax on vacant property. So we're not talking just second homes, we're talking any type of vacant property vacant real property in in the city the tax is five dollars per one hundred dollars of assessed value so um um whereas the ordinary property tax rate is about 85 cents so it's really a punitive tax for keeping properties vacant within the city so they raise about um 10 million dollars a year from that tax um and they're the studies that they have conducted on that tax is that it, it's, it's quite unclear whether this tax has actually incentivized a property owners to put their properties into use or not. A lot of people just end up paying the tax and that's why they're collecting about $10 million in, in revenue. The other um, jurisdiction that I, that I found that had a vacant property tax is Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. They have a vacant property tax of 3% on the value of the home that is not a primary residence. And as I, similar to what I suggested earlier, in order to determine whether this is not a primary residence, every year the, the owner of the property has to declare whether the house is a, a primary residence or not. And if it's not, then it pays the 3% uh, value. And again, the studies on this um, vacant property tax have been pretty inconclusive as to whether it is um, um, has affected prices in the Vancouver area, as I don't know if this committee is aware, but Vancouver is one of the most expensive housing markets in the entire world. Um, and the studies on this have, have not been conclusive to find that whether this has helped mitigate the price increases um, by bringing on more supply of, of single family and apartment com um, dwellings to the supply in Vancouver. So that's all I have. Um, I've gotten the go ahead to come to Ways and Means when I have time so, or when I'm done. So if there are any questions, I can answer them now. Great, thank you for that. That was very helpful. Do members have questions for Mr. Campbell? One. Um, I'm just curious, what was the rationale or what is the rationale for that five, going back a few slides, that $5,000 um, deduction on uh, is transfer taxes? The first five thousand, or whatever that was. Yeah, capital, on capital gains. Yeah. yeah. What's the rationale for that? So, um, so I should say that that capital gains exclusion is in Vermont. I only said the five thousand, but it's actually two parts. It's five thousand dollars, or forty percent of the capital gains if the capital gains come from the sale of a investment property, a um, a farm, or timberland, and so. The reason for that statute, the, the statutory purpose is to, there's three parts. One is to um, to tax or to um, incentivize in saving savings and investment in Vermont. The second is to prevent, you know, the impacts of a one-time big sale of capital gains on someone's tax. So you let's say you're making fifty thousand dollars a year, you own a business or something like that, you sell it, and all of a sudden your income spikes to one year, and that puts you into a higher rate. So this helps bring you back into a more normal position. The third is to mit mitigate the portion of a capital gain that might be due to inflation. So capital gains are not indexed to inflation at all. Um, so if you bought an asset in 1900 and it didn't increase in value at all, but you were just getting inflation, you would be taxed on that. Um, on just the inflation side. So it helped mitigate that. But more historically, that capital gains exclusion, I think is more of a relic from what Vermont's tax code previously used to be. Um, Vermont's tax code used to be just 24% of the federal tax liability. And federally, there is the incentive for capital gains of the lower tax rates. And so when Vermont sort of decoupled from the federal tax code, this was sort of our way to keep that federal benefit 
in the Vermont tax code. So over the when that switch happened, it used to, it was originally just 40% of all capital gains could be excluded. And over the years, the General Assembly has sort of whittled away at that capital gains exclusion um, to the point that it is now the where it's either you take five thousand dollars on any type of asset or forty percent um, of the capital gain um, if it's the sale of timber farm or investment property. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, committee. Um, we need a break. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to need to uh, check in with our witnesses and make a plan. Uh, so let's take a seven minute break. Thank you. 